everyone, hello, and welcome to At The Table, a show that asks you to pull out your chairs, get your TTRPG books, and join us at the table. And speaking of RPG books, TTRPG books, oh boy, ah, we got a good one. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to show it off yet, because I want to have a reveal. I mean, it's going to be a it's gonna be a lazy reveal, but it's going to be good. It's going to be worth oh, it. Wait, anyway, real, real quick, real quick. Uh, Men are saying there's no sound. Um, there should be sound. Yeah, I'm hearing sound number the playback. Oh, yeah, okay, good, good. All right. <laughs> I, I was just worried because I was looking at chat. <laughs> hey, God bless you for having our back. So mm -hmm. we appreciate it either way. Uh, and that being said, uh, so let's let's get into the introductions so we can get to today's episode. Because I've been, I've been waiting for this bad boy since the play test. Both of us. Uh, both of us, that's true. Um, so Mr. Michael Powell, please tell them who you are and where they can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. Well, as always, I am the dashing, the dastardly dashing, Michael Powell, and you can find me all over the internet on my social medias, which are at Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O. And how about you? My name is PJ McGaw. You can find me all over the internet at PJ.McGaw. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Come find me. Come friend me. Let's have fun. Uh, and without further ado... Let's get into today's big bad boy. Mm -hmm. So, oh God, when did we first cover the playtest? Was that October of last year? Oh God, I I want to say that. No way, I I want to kind of say that it was a little bit before because since then I played both of the playtest classes. That's right. That that is absolutely right. Uh, I've only been able to play the uh, one of the playtest mm -hmm. classes with Jasper's game day run by No Nat once. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, sometime in August, early September, it finally arrived in hardback form. They had some uh, distribution problems, so everything was like PDF mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah. But y'all, yeah. Secrets of Magic mm -hmm. finally Ooh, came out. Look looks nice. Looks thing. nice. Yep. Oh, I want to oh. talk about it. I love the mm. feel of it in mm -hmm. my hands. The, the cool blue look. Oh, I feel, I feel like I'm picking mm. up like classroom literature on, <laughs> on how to be a bamf and get away with murder. Mm -hmm. Like it's so good, y'all. Oh, uh, I I wanna get a hard a uh, hard copy myself soon and I'm actually thinking of getting spending a little extra cash to get that limited edition red cover. Mm. The, oh the red leather tones are yeah. so good. If, if you got the money, get all the, mm -hmm. the, the deluxe editions. So you have like, this really fancy library yeah. and like, oh are He's got encyclopedias. He's a man of class. It's like, no, I'm a man of class is. Uh, no, these man are all of, my Pathfinder books. PJ, man of class and culture. Man of class and culture. That's right. Mm -hmm. You're a rogue scholar and a cleric scholar, too. Yeah. Oh, uh, really quick. Um, there was one thing that I have seen a few people complain about, but I don't, for myself, I don't mind, that the binding on the red cover is just slightly different from the other ones. I'm like, meh. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I love is you see, you know, like those old like European books that monks mm. did, where everything was yeah. work of art. You can see there's that attention to detail still here. In fact, uh -huh. quick look behind this things here. Even the actual Ooh. book materials have the same filigree, and they even have these amazing little uh, mm -hmm. notes to consider when you look stuff up. And it's it's exactly what was promised and mm -hmm. more. You get two. Yeah brand new full classes mm -hmm. which are amazing i'm playing the magus mm -hmm. they improve we're going to talk about it one day but i will just give like a little drop it's good yeah. the magic items are insanely awesome mm -hmm. they added a lot of runes which i mean arguably probably should have been there to begin mm -hmm. with but now now it's all there yeah hundreds of magic items and what we're going to be talking about today some really awesome magic archetypes yeah uh we will be talking about the new classes a lot like as someone who has played both of the playtest classes and kind of gave a kind of a cursory look at the finalized version there were ch there was a there's a lot of changes there's a lot of changes but we will be getting to that uh later on in the month as pj said we will be doing um three art three archetypes uh today and yeah it's going to be really, really fun. Yeah. So what's exciting about the magical archetypes is if you've watched our shows and you've seen the archetypes from uh, the Advanced Player's Guide, you know that there is a lot, and of course the Lost Omens World Guide, Character Guide. Mm -hmm. There are some really fascinating ways that they're doing archetypes. It's not just like it was 
in Pathfinder 1 and D&D 2.5, where it was just this kind of, um, not nebulous, but a tertiary idea that you could tack on. Now mm. it's being uh, regimented. You have yeah. job archetypes, uh, like the medic and the archaeologist mm. and the celebrity or the dandy. So now if you want to play a job, you can. Um, there is prestige class archetype because Dragon Disciple mm -hmm. and Shadow Dancer is still so good. Um, you have, of course, multi-class archetype, which makes multi-classing delicious. Uh, and what other crazy things? Uh, um, organization archetypes, like the Firebrand Braggart and all the Hell Knights and all mm -hmm. the Last Wall Knights. Like, it's really cool stuff. Oh, yeah. So, so now they're doing magic archetypes mm -hmm. things that make your magic different from mm -hmm. every other wizard uh cleric druid sorcerer mm -hmm. now you know now the the, the casters mm -hmm. get something that make their playing and character experience mm -hmm. very juicy yeah uh, can i also uh point out something really quick um well us looking at these archetypes and kind of doing these deep dives on classes on the show is also kind of our first look at everything kind of so we're kind of along with you on that journey so yeah. little fy absolutely look behind the curtain we have prepped what we want to talk about today just before we got live but mm -hmm. to make sure that we're coming out with fresh eyes and a hot take mm -hmm. hot take uh we are waiting until now so yep. let's get into it there's when we cover three the first one is the flexible caster mm -hmm. archetype um so we have the books, we have the materials right mm -hmm. here, but we're going to be pulling this from Archives of Nethys just because, A, the website's amazing, and thank you, Paizo, for supporting Archives mm -hmm. of Nethys, but also it makes everything easier to read for yeah. the show for you all. Yeah. Uh, really quick, uh, also, what's kind of cool about these, uh, so a lot of these caster cla uh, new caster archetypes is you can actually take them from level one. Isn't that right, That's DJ? That's true, yeah. There's, there's a kind of a fun, cool thing that you can do at level one because uh, normally you can only pick them up at two, mm -hmm. four, six, eight whenever the dedication feat kicks in. But Flexible Spellcaster has a preparation shift at mm -hmm. first level. We'll get to that in a second. But this is cool because right away your class becomes drastically different yeah. and grows differently than what you'd expect your wizard or your sorcerer to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you want to read that one sentence flavor, or shall I? Why don't you read the sentence flavor, and I'll get the mechanics right after. All right. Flexible Spellcaster, uh, Secrets of Magic, page 209. You've learned how to cast spells flexibly, blending the best elements of spontaneous and prepared spellcasting at the cost of casting fewer spells each day. That's right. This class feature alters your spellcasting class features, such as arcane spellcasting for the, with the wizard, or divine spellcasting for the cleric. So there's no limitations there. If you choose this class archetype, you must select the flexible spellcaster dedication as your second level class feat. Uh, prerequisites, you must have a class such as clerics, druids, witches, and wizards that prepares spells in their spell slots. So unfortunately, the spontaneous dudes can't really benefit from this too much. Flexible spellcaster adjustments, though. You learn spells as normal for your class. A wizard uses a spell book, a witch teaches spells so they're familiar, and so on. But you change your spell casting from your class in these ways. You cast fewer spells each day. According to the table uh, related to this class, you only get two spells per spell level a day. Um... They don't advance to three. Mm -hmm. Reduce the number of cantrips you gain from your class by two. This archetype doesn't change the way you prepare cantrips. You just get two less. And I will say this. You still top out at the maximum of five. So it's not too scary. <laughs> During your daily preparations, you prepare a spell collection rather than preparing spells into each spell slot individually. The number of spells in your spell collection each day equals the total number of spell slots you get each day from your spell class. Select these spells from the same source as normal, such as a spell book for a wizard. You can cast any of the spells in your collection by using a spell slot of an appropriate level. For instance, if you're level 1 and had Featherfall and Magic Missile in your spell collection, you could cast Featherfall twice that day, Magic Missile twice that day, or 
each spell once. Extra spell slots you gain that have additional restrictions, like the Wizard's Specialist School spells or the Cleric Divine Font spells, don't change due to this archetype. Which, if you're playing a Cleric, if you're like me, you just breathe a huge sigh of relief. Uh, nor do spells, uh, such spells count toward the number of spells you place in your spell collection. So, effectively speaking, what the crux of this does at level 1 um, yeah, you're going to get less spells a day, but it kind of functions like what I think a lot of us already sort of do, maybe, mm -hmm. under the table, where we just get all of our spells that we know, and then we just kind of throw it out there at the level we want it to be. Now, normally, yeah. we still are limited by level and such, blah, 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 um, but this is great because if you have a uh, collection of spells, you can on the fly take your first level spell and then cast it at whatever highest level you want to without having prepared it first mm -hmm. or losing that prepared spell slot for another spell only if you have some class feature. Now, forget about it. Everything is uh, flexible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind, I kind of want to say, from at least the sound of it, you could play a prepared spellcaster such as a wizard, essentially like a, like a sorcerer. Yeah, and I think that's kind of um, uh, the the goal here, because like wizards, especially in especially in Pathfinder, where now there's like hundreds of spells. The the thing that makes them great and also tricky is that they have a lot of access to magic. They have mm -hmm. the most access to magic, but they are still kind of hampered by the fact that they have to prepare everything ahead of time. And how mm -hmm. often have you been in a game and someone's like, "Oh man, can you?" Uh, cast that spell, and the and the cleric or the wizard has to go. I can't. I didn't prepare it today. Yeah, yeah. Not anymore, buddy. And also earlier when you were saying uh, talking about uh, heightening spells, um, I'm just gonna read here the heightening spells uh, information. Once you gain second level spells, you can heighten any spells in your spell collection to any level you could cast, similar to a spontaneous spellcaster signature spell. The only restriction is that you must select at least one first level spell for your collection each time you prepare, ensuing, ensuring that you can use all your spell slots each day. I mean, and it would make sense, yeah. because if you prepared nothing but ninth level spells at level 20, you're, scre you're screwed. Yeah. You're so screwed. Yeah. Um, now, I want to go back and something, because the, in the chart, the flexible spellcasters, yeah, you have two less spells a day, but the collection is, is a lot mm -hmm. more up front. Like, the chart basically shows that at level 20, you're going to have an 18-spell collection pool. Mm -hmm. And you, if you've played this game, you know that sometimes 18 spells is more than enough to figure out what the hell you're going to Yeah, do. yeah, yeah. I kind of also want to say, um, you know what, you, this... This uh, flexible spellcaster, it really, I want to say, it stops really mattering how many spells you could cast once you get to, I want to say, a level 5, level 6. Especially, typical game, I kind of want to say, these days are 3 to 6 hours long, right? Yeah, generally speaking, they're about 3 to 6 hours long. It really depends on the mm -hmm. group. Um, last night, I did Strength of Thousands, and it was a 2-hour game. Mm -hmm. Um and it's interesting, it's definitely refreshing, mm -hmm. but it does make time, like, very important. How you spend that time becomes very Yeah, important. but at 5th to 6th level, you have 6 levels, uh, six spells you cast per day. That should be more than enough, and then you, on top of that, you have cantrips, which are all day, every day. That's true, and the, and the blessing here is, yeah, you're going to feel a little nervous because you, you're losing a lot of what would normally be your maximum spell potential. Mm -hmm. But what's great is by level four, you have your full retinue cantrips again. Mm -hmm. um, and you're getting two bullets in every level of a chamber. That's kind of dicey mm -hmm. if, if you're worried about that. But depending on what your class is, you still have those dedicated spell slots. Yeah. Like if you are a war priest and you went with a harm font, mm -hmm. you, you're you not going to run out of necromant uh, negative damage. Yeah. You're, you're going to be fine. And it, it kind of makes more sense for a yeah. war priest too because – why would you want to worry about prep? You're in the middle of combat. You have to heal, kill, buff. You have to do everything at once. Mm -hmm. Flexibility is extremely necessary for a war priest. Yeah, and I also kind of I always say this: uh, when playing a spellcaster, cantrips are your bread and butter. Don't think of your first level spells as your bread and butter. It's your cantrips that are your bread and butter. 
a hundred percent. If you are playing a caster, and this is a hot take and this is probably too spicy, if you are playing a caster that is not a Magus and you are using your melee weapon, you messed up. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, you done goofed. Your cantrips actually will level faster mm -hmm. and better than the melee weapons, mm -hmm. especially when most of them still allow you to put into effect your modifier. Now, yes, there is a thing that weapons get, like, weapon specializations and a whole bunch of things to tack on, blah, 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 blah. Yes, that's true. But still, being able to reliably do double the dice damage that a melee warrior would do and then crit mm -hmm. doubling that, use your cantrips. They are there yeah. for this purpose. Yeah, if you want um, pure raw damage, telekinetic projectile. Or oh, so good. Oh, yeah. Too. Oh, yeah. Or one of my favorites, Daze. <laughs> Daze. Yeah, what I love about telekinetic uh, projectiles, A, it can crit. Two, it's one of the highest damaging, fastest scaling cantrips mm -hmm. in the game, and it works with, I think, ha like half, if not three quarters, of the um, magical arrangements. Or yeah, like I think, um, you know what? I'm gonna double check this because I kind of want to say, I kind of primal might be the only one that doesn't get it. Yeah, because I, I know for a fact Arcane and Occult both get yeah. telekinetic projectile. I'm a little on the fence if D uh, Divine does. I don't uh, know. Okay. Primal doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Checking Divine. Yes. Divine also doesn't. Okay. Still, half does. And this is a ranged attack. At least it can be done at range. A decent mm -hmm. range of that. And, uh... Oh, th there's also one more. Apparently this is a, this is a new spell list. Elemental. Yeah. Yes, there's so many cool... Y'all, this book comes mm -hmm. with so much cool stuff. We'll get to it eventually. But elemental spells are a thing, and... If you want to, dude, if you want to have your Avatar Last Airbender best <laughs> life in Paizo, get a monk and take the mm -hmm. elemental uh, spell uh, ancestry, but, or archetype, but back to this archetype. So, heightening spells like Michael Powell was talking about, yeah, move on the fly. Now we have the adjudicating class feat and features. This is also, we're not even into level two yet. This mm -hmm. is just the meat of what this does. Some of your class feats and features might rely on the fact that you prepare spells in spell slots. While some class feats may, uh, might no longer work or be necessary with the flexible spellcaster archetype, in many cases, you can make a simple replacement and continue using the class feat. The following class feats simply require replacing a spell you have prepared or a prepared spell for a spell in your collection or a spell slot. For example, in Counterspell, you'd replace a spell you prepared in the trigger for a spell in your collection and expended a prepared spell for a spell slot. Mm -hmm. Similarly, sim sim similarly, similarly, yeah, whatever. That's similarly. Similarly. <laughs> in Arcane Bond, you would replace cast one spell you prepared today and already cast with cast one spell in your collection you've already cast today, counterspell, and the Leyline Conduit feats. We'll get to Leyline Magic in another episode. Uh... In the core rulebook, need these substitutions, as does form retention from the Advanced Player's Guide. Spell Mastery provides additional restricted spells like Divine Font or Specialist Spells. You can take it, but it doesn't add to your collection and works like normal prepared spells. So, you know, when you get special, like, tertiary spell slots off your list that give you cool stuff, those are still fine. Those are untouched. Those are still balanced. Those are good. Mm -hmm. This is literally a net win for war priests and every wizard out there, and maybe some witches if you really want to have, like, your sorcerer experience with your witchy coven vibe. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, then next up is there are some downsides. There's, there's always going to be power comes at a price. <laughs> there are some disallowed feats... Um, if you take this archetype, the following feats from the core, core rulebook aren't available for the flexible spellcaster. Call the Wild, Clever Counterspell, Infinite Possibilities, Reprepare Spell, and Spell Combination. The disallows feats from the advanced player's guides are as follows. Elemental Summons, Miraculous Possibility, Rites of Convocation, and Rites of Transfiguration. So, I th there are some some things you can't take. 
and I see why they've done this. It, it actually kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of these feats are giving you the knowledge of a spell. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the whole issue with it is that since you have a collection of spells, which kind of replaces or I guess I could say supersedes the knowledge function, whenever a feat would come up that would be like, you know the spell. It's like, no, not with flexible casting. Yeah. The whole idea is it's not that you know these. You just have a pool of spells you would normally know. Yeah, it's um, honestly it's it's more language than anything, game balance I guess. I guess. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, PJ, why don't you take the dedication itself? All right, so flexible spellcaster dedication feat. When you take this feat at level two, you get four cantrips instead of three, and then at level four, you get five cantrips instead of four. This is the dedication feat that you have to take at level two mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. And this is what I was saying. This kind of fixes the problem of you only having three cantrips a day. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the flexible spellcaster. You start off at level one, dedication feat at level two, and it's done. Yeah. The changes are made. The buffs are given. Mm -hmm. you're, you're all flexibled out. Have yeah. a good day. If you want to take another archetype, be free, feel free to. You don't have to take another archetype, another two archetype to... Uh, Make sure to stay into this dedication. Absolutely, yeah, because it's only got the one dedication feat. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the rule, like you have to have two feet for each change. By level two, you're done. You have this badass addition to your character, and you can go on further builds. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine a war priest with this, and then taking... I don't know, I can't think of a really exciting archetype that would make sense. I guess champion? Let's go with champion. Champion could work, or... Maybe the next archetype that we're going to talk about, Rune Lord. Yes, y'all, I got so excited when I saw this. If you know about the Pathfinder modules and campaigns, the first ever, first ever Pathfinder campaign, Adventure Path, if you will, was Rise of the Rune Lords. A Rune Lord is deep, deep Pathfinder lore. It was basically the society that once was that got too big and, and crumbled mm -hmm. and failed. And they're trying to come back with new Thassalon. So th the fact that you get to play as a rune lord is... It's, it's like playing like one of the old Sith lords from Star mm -hmm. Wars. It's so yeah. good. I guess, I, honestly though, yeah, I guess you can't take... Uh, go Clint War Priest and then Rune Lord. You, you might have to go the other way around. True. You, well, <laughs> hey, you know... You might be able to take uh, some dedication feats later. Uh, yeah. Actually, this looks pretty stacked. Uh, well, why don't we get into it? Do you want me to hit the the lore or the specialization? Uh, how about I hit the lore and then we'll take turns take turns with the seven. Well, yeah, you'll t you'll do the specialization uh, specialization and then we'll take turns with the seven schools. Sounds good. All right, Rune Lord, Secrets of Magic, page two forty. You've learned arcane magic following the path of the Rune Lords. You unlock secrets of a chosen school of magic while forsaking lesser schools. You learn the secrets of runic magic, the building blocks of magic, but be warned, you might succumb to, to sin in your pursuit of power. You also learn to use poarms, the signature weapons of the Rune Lords, and can acquire the secrets of the mighty ancient magic items called Aeon Stones, embedding them into your skin. Yeah, and to give you a heads up about the sin, it'll make a lot more sense as we go through. Like, the deep rune lord lore of Old Thassalon basically was that there are these seven runes of different uh, virtues. And the virtues were, like, um, of a powerful tyrant leader. Like, things mm -hmm. you needed to be effective as a conqueror, that kind of thing. And, and so, and so it, essentially, there are actually sins. The seven virtues of Old Thassalon are basically the seven sins of being a good leader. Um, so everything here is going to be kind of talking about the seven, um, well, the seven sins uh, and how it's going to inform stuff. At least I would imagine, because mm -hmm. that's kind of what the lore was. It's so, it's very anime. <laughs> what, what was that anime with Meliodas? The, uh, the, the seven, seven sins. The seven, seven deadly sins. Seven. And they're all mages. It's the rune yeah, lords are basically yeah. Meliodas and his friends. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, like so I said, like I was gonna yeah, say, like I said before, like we both said before, the people of Paizo are weebs. Oh, big, big time. They they confirmed <laughs> it. They confirmed it on my Twitter. 
Yeah, if you remember in the the deep dive we did for Monk, um, the level twenty Monk ability is legit going Super Saiyan. Mm -hmm. That's one hundred percent what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so the the Rune Lord specialization again, you get this at first level. Uh, you draw untold power from runes, sometimes called sin magic, which the idea of sin magic is very interesting thought process in my head. You associate with one of the seven vices, also known as the seven rewards of rule, envy, abjuration, gluttony, necromancy, greed, transmutation, lust, enchantment, pride, illusion, sloth, conjuration, and wrath, evocation. Studying these techniques often tempts you with the associated sin. While leaning into it could corrupt you, it might make you more powerful. If you choose this class archetype, you must select the Rune Lord dedication as your second level class feat. Prerex, though, you must be a wizard, specializing in one of the seven schools other than divination. So, you gotta be a wizard, unfortunately can't be a cleric for this. The Rune Lord adjustments are as follows. In addition to the normal school spell for your chosen school of magic, you learn the initial rune spell associated with your school, with its school adjusted to your chosen school of magic, if it wasn't, and they use the word school too much, if it wasn't from that school already. Your pool of focus points increases to two focus points, one for your wizard level one school spell and one for your rune lord school spell. At 8th level, you also learn the advanced rune spell associated with that school, also adjusting it to match your chosen school of magic if it wasn't already, and you get three focus points. So what's cool about this is that you do not have to worry about taking feats that give focus points to get more focus points. Mm -hmm. You just freaking get them. Yeah. Uh, you can refocus by... Now, this is roleplay that's very interesting. Really make sure you talk with your GM and your players about this. Because you get to refocus by indulging in your school's sin in lieu of studying your spell book. You don't have to sit down and read a book, but you have to do something potentially kind of bad. As you become more powerful, your indulgence grows. At 12th level, if you indulge in your sin to refocus, you, uh, if you've spent at least two focus points since the last time you, you were focused, you recover two instead of one. At 18th level, you get three instead of two. This is kind of dope because we've seen at this point on the show, there's a lot of classes where to get this ability, you have to take a special mm -hmm. feat for it. Sometimes it makes sense to, to take that, and sometimes it doesn't, depending on your build. You get that ability for free as you level up. Mm -hmm. um, you, you are now trained in pole arms, martial pole arms. At 11th level, if you gain weapon expertise in anything, you become an expert in martial pole arms. So now you have a heavy weapon that you can use. You have uh, guaranteed three focus points as well as refocusing ones to get all three back. Like this is a very powerful starting set yeah. that takes care of itself. Finally, you lose the ability to prepare or cast any spell from your school's prohibited schools. You remove all spells from those schools from your spell list, meaning you can't even activate scrolls or wands of such spells. Mm -hmm. So as you go into the schools, there's going to be this antithesis. I would imagine things like wrath cannot be like lazy and slothish. Mm -hmm. So I also kind of want to say uh, this, this is just the whole uh, you got to refocus your sin thing. Uh, there are some things that could end up kind of problematic, especially with uh, when consider the sin of lust. But I also want people to understand, lust is not always, you know, the fade of black, hanky panky sort of thing. You can indulge in the sin of lust uh, by doing other things like, you know, lust of life. Honestly, roof it. Just you know, bend the bend the language, so to speak. Yeah, there's definitely some of the vices that are. Um, harder to do. Like, like lust is hard to make mm -hmm. work without, without potentially creeping people out. Yeah. Um, and I think at that point, if you want to like allude to it, that might be the way mm -hmm. to go instead of like, you know, tell, don't show, because we're going to need mm -hmm. to see that. I think you might be able to get away, away with wrath because like, yeah, excessive violence is hard to manage, but like if you go mm -hmm. out and you punch a tree for an hour, okay, Goku, we get it. Like, it's fine. No, just go, just go to a bar and, you know, just go in a bar, 
flip a flip a table and just leave. That's it. <laughs> Nobody knows what's, like why why you come in come in and uh, flip a table. Mm. I love that. It's like yeah, this 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 roided out mage with this like twelve foot glaive just came in, flipped like three tables, flipped the bird to the bartender who wasn't even on duty, and then walked out. Didn't cause a mess. Didn't cause a fight. Just flipped some tables. Oh. You know what? That it would be even more helpful if, and then he, you know, he he stuck around, he he, he put everything back and uh, apologized to the <laughs> to the bartender and left. <laughs> I love the idea of a polite wrath mage. So there's someone who walks in and they go, "Hi, um, I need to get all my magic." Oh. Oh Clean yeah. Up and I'll be oh. out of your hair before the first rush. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, and he sticks around, puts everything back and. You know what? Here, here, here's uh, here's five gold. Uh, just ignore. Just this never happened. <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like that kind of has to be the way, right? And then yeah. it gets and it's funny. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, let's why don't we hit the seven schools just so we can kind of yeah. learn more about what you're going to be uh, All right. getting and what you're going to have to be like standing. For. Uh, should I kick it off? Yeah, why don't you kick it off? All right. Uh, actually, I'm going to kick it off twice because I just want to point out that uh, in this uh, the Thessalonians, I think that's how you pronounce it, Thessalonians, mm -hmm. don't consider divination magic to be something that every wizard should learn. Oh, they do consider that uh, divination magic is something that every wizard should learn, but none need to take it to work. To the... It's like a lesser school to them. It's like, um, I guess you could say, if it's a school, it's like elementary school. It's the basics. It's like, yeah, it's like, um, oh gosh, like, every every school teaches gen ed, but it's... It's, it's gym. It's gym. It's gym. It's gym. It's gym. Gym is divination. There you go. There you go. But honestly, oh, we, we yeah. both know the only reason is it just, it's eight schools, but there's only seven sins, so something had to be... <laughs> yeah, wink, wink. It's like, let's just pretend it's like something everyone has to. I think it's also so that there's like a neutral ground of magic that mm -hmm. everyone can have, and divination is kind of a very good utility for all wizards to have. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the first school, though, is abjuration, which is the sin of envy. Rumors of abjuration specialize in protective magic and in suppressing all other magic to glorify their own. The prohibited schools are evocation and, and necromancy. Uh, the rune spells are... There's two rune spells. The initial is blind ambition, should we go into each of these rune spells, PJ? Of course, of course. All right. Uh, blind ambition is, let's see, it's uh, one focus. Domain is ambition. Two actions to cast, somatic and verbal. 60 feet range and targets one creature. Saving throw of willpower and a duration of 10 minutes. You strengthen a target's ambition, increase its resent... Res yeah, resentment of allies and make its alliances more susceptible to change. The target must attempt a will save. Critical success, the target is unaffected. Success, the target takes a minus one status penalty to its saving throws and other defenses against attempts to coerce it, request something of it, or use mental ma effects to convince it to do something such as a suggestion spell. This penalty applies only if the target is being encouraged to advance in its own ambitions. A failure adds success, but the penalty is negative minus two. And critical failure, the target is overcome with ambition, taking whatever actions would advance its own agenda over those of anyone else, even without attempts to convince it. This is an interesting focus spell uh, because its, its sole purpose is to debuff someone for the inevitable mind mm -hmm. control spell later. And that's really fascinating, because like, is that is that gonna be you casting a mind control spell? Are you tag teaming with someone else? And, and just the thought of, because I, I know there's a ton of spells and feats. There's feats that give you resistances to like mind and emotional uh, spell abilities. And there's spells who are designed to just affect your mind and your mental. Mm -hmm. Imagine like a Jedi walking into a room and just stripping your mental disciplines a little bit so the other Jedi can go and mind trick. Like, it's a very fascinating it's like in, punch. Yeah, it's, it's like in basketball. You're setting up for a layup. Yeah, you're setting that pick. 
Uh -huh. uh, TJ is kind of quiet. Let me see what I can do to oh. fix that. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, next up is Competitive Edge. Uh, fourth level focus spell. The domain is Ambition. Cast is one action, verbal, and the duration is up to one minute. Your competitiveness drives you to prove yourself against the opposition. You gain a plus one status bonus to attack rolls and skill checks. If an enemy within 20 feet critically succeeds at an attack roll or skill check, your status bonus increases to plus three attack rolls or that specific skill check, whichever the foe critically succeeded at for one round. Heighten at level seven, increase the base bonus to plus two, and the increased bonus after the enemy critically succeeds to a plus four. All right, I just upped the volume, so hopefully I'm not too loud on your end, Michael. No, you're, good. Uh, you're good. Okay, good. So what I like about Competitive Edge is that the entire thing about the Rune Lords is that they were not uh, uh, only wizards. They were very mm -hmm. uh, uh, tact tact uh, tactical. Yeah, tactical like lords of war as well as amazing warriors of the glaive. Uh, that was kind of like their focus weapon. Um, that like you know, if you were a good rune lord, you were great at a, at a pole arm. So I like that there's a there's a, a thing here that like kind of embraces this idea that they they weren't just weak casters; they were mm -hmm. awesome warriors too. Yeah, honestly, from the sounds of it, uh, abjuration, they they sound like the jocks. <laughs> <laughs> I can kind of see that. I let's see, it's definitely it's definitely like one of what I imagine to be like two or three different physical entities of the rune lord way um yeah i say jock mainly for a fact that uh they're competitive <laughs> literally they're rune spells yeah, yeah they're, well they're they're envy so i imagine yeah. envy makes you competitive because you're like oh i want that trophy yeah uh let me see what conjure i imagine we're going one after yeah, the yeah, so yeah, yeah, conjuration yeah, yeah. next okay so the rune lords of conjuration use their magic to create to create what they need as they need it and call forth servants to do their bidding. If you couldn't tell, conjuration is the sin of sloth. So the prohibited schools are necromancy and transmutation. Makes sense. You don't want anything you've made to be destroyed, and you don't want anything you've made to be changed when you could just make a new one. Uh, PJ, PJ, it's prohibited schools, at least on my end, says evocation and illusion. On conjuration? Yeah. Oh, you know what? My brain jumped to enchantment. You're right. Evocation and illusion. Um... Well, it makes sense still, because evocation, yeah. blow it up, transmutation, no, mm -hmm. sorry, illusion. Illusion. Eyes, it's right here. Just look mm -hmm. at that. Uh, so the rune spells are efficient, a port, and swamp of sloth. Let's okay, check it out. Let's see, what, let's see what efficient a port is. This is a focus level one spell, one action, 60 feet, one unattained object uh, of light bulk or less. Walking over to an item to pick it up, I love the flavor of this. Check this out. Walking over to an item to pick it up is so much effort. Yes. <laughs> Whether it's your spell book, a reagent, or a glass of wine, it's simply more efficient to call it to your hand. You teleport the target into your open hand. If you don't have a hand free, it falls to the ground at your feet. Heightened at third level, it can be an unattained object with a bulk one or less. Uh, at fifth feet, uh, it's range of 120, and it can be bulk one or less. At seven, uh, seventh level focus, it's 120, with a bulk of two or less. So, you you really are taking on the sin of sloth. You're like, oh, but uh, turn on my lamp, but it's over there. No, no, I want you. I want to turn it's it on. It's a foot away. <laughs> <laughs> there's this there's this old uh, um uh, oh gosh, my brain is farting. A comic strip that um. Penny Arcade did it was like some quest in World of Warcraft be like, I need you to fetch me my holy tome or turn off the light of darkening. And the person's like, it's literally right over there. Uh, so the next oh. one, Swamp of Sloth. It's a focus level three spell, uh, one to three action uh, cast, so it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a five-foot burst within 120 feet. Basic fortitude save lasts for a minute. Ground in the area turns swampy and fetid. The area is difficult terrain. The sludge at the bottom of the morass animates into a diminutive sludge beasts that have a demonic appearance. 
these don't function as normal creatures. I would hope not. But they swarm over creatures in the swamp and exude a noxious stench. The swamp deals 1d6 poison damage. Creatures that end their turn in the area must attempt a basic fortitude save. You can increase the number of actions it takes to cast a spell for each additional action. Makes the burst radius bigger by 5 feet. For every 2 levels of heightened, it's an additional 1d6, and the radius gets 5 feet bigger. Um, so at level 20, let's see, that's uh, 5, 7, 9, 11... 13, 15, 17, 19. You are, see, that is 7. So that is... At level 20, this will do about 8d6 poison damage and have a minimum foot breadth of about 30 to 35 feet in radius. So about 75 to 80 feet diameter, about 70, 75 feet mm -hmm. diameter. So it's this gigantic, just dummy thick, 86 poison damage that's now difficult terrain, so it's hard to get through. Mm -hmm. can, can I just say, um, the diminutive uh, sludge beast, in my mind, is the poop demon from Dogma. It's like small poop demons from Dogma. I'm just, I mean, I'm just going straight to Warmer 40k and calling it like, this is like the Nurgle thing. This is your Nurgle power. Uh, Reap Psyche, great to see you in chat. I don't know if you missed it, but we are covering, we just finished the Flexible Caster, which is Choice, and we're now covering the Rune Lord archetype from the Secrets of Magic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I'm really excited. All right. Next up is Enchantment. Uh, this is the Sin of Lust. Rune Lords of Enchantment specialize in magic that compels and controls the mind of others, often to fulfill their own needs and desires. Sounds like a uh, certain investigator we all know. Uh, the prohibited schools are necromancy and transmutation. The rune spells are initial, which is charming touch. Let's see that. Um, first level focus spell, the domain of passion. Uh, one action, somatic, range of touch, targets one creature that could find you attractive. I, li I like that, I like that. Mm -hmm. uh, saving throw of will and duration of 10 minutes. You infuse your target with attraction, causing it to act friendlier towards you. The target attempts a will save. It gains a plus 4 circumstance bonus to this save if you or your allies recently threatened or were hostile to it. Critical success, the target is unaffected and aware you try to charm it. Success, the target is unaffected but thinks your spell was something harmless instead of charming touch, unless it identifies the spell. Failure. The target's attitude becomes friendly towards you. If it was friendly, it becomes helpful. It can't use hostile actions against you. Critical failure. The target is helpful and can't use hostile actions against you. You can dismiss the spell if you use the hostile actions against the target, the spell ends. After the spell ends, the target doesn't necessarily realize it was charmed unless its friendship with you or the actions you convinced it to take clash with its expectations, which could potentially allow you to convince the target to continue being your friend via mundane means. That's, that last part's kind of heartbreaking. The target doesn't necessarily realize it was charmed unless its friendship with you uh, clashed with its expectations. It's like, but, but we were, we were going to go to the monster truck rally. You said you wanted to go. Uh, see, um, that, see, that's why I say, uh, you know, with um, situations like that, you build a relationship on money. I mean, you can't go wrong as so long as money's passing hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. Um, we have one more uh, the advanced uh, rune spell, I believe. It is called Captivating Adoration. It's a fourth level focus, domain of passion, two actions to cast, somatic and verbal, and an area of 15 foot emulation, saving throw of will, and a duration of one minute. You become intensely entrancing, and the creature's are distracted by you as long as they remain within the area. You could exclude any creatures you choose from the effects. When a creature enters the area for the first time, it must attempt a will saving throw. If a creature leaves and re-enters, it uses the results of the original save. Critical success, the creature is unaffected and temporarily immune for one hour. Success. 
the target of uh, the creature is fascinated with you with his uh, next action and then is temporarily immune for one hour. Failure, the creature is fascinated with you. And then critical failure. The creature is fascinated with you and its attitude attitude towards you improves by one step. And uh, heighten one, increase the size of the emulation by 15 feet. So that means in six levels, uh, this will become... Oh God, uh, 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90. This will become a 90 foot emanation. If I'm doing my math correctly, I may be off. Correct me, please. Mm -hmm. um, I also that would is, yeah. that's insane. I also would like to say uh, captivating adoration is basically your Beyonce. Yeah. What I like about this is that um, every time they, they enter and leave, it reuses the same role. So if some poor, unfortunate NPC critically fails, right, um, yeah, the, the attitude's going to improve by one step. And every time they come back into that thing, into that circle, they're just going to constantly be treating that as a critical failure, um, at least for that minute. Yeah. So it's just like, I love you so much. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a bad time. Yeah, um, I actually also kind of want to say before we jump to the next school, a little something a little fun. Um, chat, what do you think? Uh, which school do you think uh, me and PJ would uh, belong to? Well, they only know the three so far. Well, we're gonna talk about the other four, so well, yeah, they well, can make up their mind now. I mean, yeah, but why don't we give them all the information? I'll tell yeah, you what. Yeah. Let's let's discuss what school we'd be in, uh, and you can start kind of planning now. When we get to the end, we'll do it all together and figure. Yeah, it out. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, PJ, I believe you're next with Wrath. Evocation. Make things go boom. Rune Lords of Evocation channel raw, destructive energies and direct them toward all who would oppose their will. The prohibited schools of evocation are abjuration and conjuration. Don't make stuff. I'll blow it up. What, you want to protect yourself? I'm going to blow it up. Uh, fireball. The initial uh, thing for evocation is weapon surge. It's one action. It's the domain of zeal. I think this is actually a cleric slash paladin focus spell. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of dope that these wizards get it. Yeah. Um, holding your weapon aloft, you fill it with divine energy. On your next strike with that weapon, before the start of your next turn, you get a plus one status bonus to attack rolls, and the weapon deals an additional die of damage. If the weapon has a striking rune, this instead increases the number of dice from the striking rune by one to a maximum of three extra weapon dice. This is a level one focus power, meaning you're getting this about level one, level two. So you are now dealing with raw physical damage, especially as someone who is proficient with a polearm, the likes of which no one else has. Maybe... Maybe if the cleric or someone else, maybe the wizard, casts magical weapon. But the fact that you can just pop this on yourself, slam it on someone at level one, makes you mm -hmm. basically like a squishy um, uh, champion or squishy yeah. barbarian at this point. Mm -hmm. Love weapon surge from the domain of zeal. Um, and it's interesting that they get access to that. Uh, and the next one is zeal for battle. Uh, this is a reaction. This is a level four focus spell. Um... The trigger to this reaction is you and at least one ally are about to roll initiative. Range of 10 feet only targets you and the other ally. You stoke the righteous anger within yourself and an ally. You and the target ally each roll a d20. Use the higher result for both of your initiative rolls. For both of your initiative rolls. You still use your own perception modifiers. That means if you have someone who is really powerful and really needs to be going soon or sooner around or later mm -hmm. then both of you have the potential to act at the same time and get some really cool teamwork uh for your efforts uh this is what's really fascinating about wrath is that like you're a wizard and you're getting access to champion focus powers mm -hmm. and, and and war priest focus yeah. powers i really find that interesting i really love that yeah. all right next up is the sin of pride which is Illusion. Rumors of Illusion use magic to create the perfect appearance and fool others through trickery, deception, and misdirection. 
the prohibited schools are conjuration and transmutation. And the rune spells are initial. Um, Veil of Confidence. Let's, uh, let's see. One focus, domain of confidence, one action verbal, and a duration of one minute. You surround yourself in a veil of confidence. You reduce your current heightened condition. Your, you, know, you reduce your current frightened condition by one. And whenever you become frightened during the duration, reduce the amount by one. If you critically fail a save against fear, veil of confidence ends immediately. And you increase any frightened condition you gain from the critical failure by one instead of decreasing it. So pretty much... Um, I guess especially if you're fighting a dragon or something, which has kind of that aura effect, or honestly, a dread stance marshal, this could, this would be a very, very big help with it. Yeah, Frightened is one of those things that gets used a lot around level one. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely something, I mean, who wants a debuff? But I feel like yeah. of all the debuffs in the game, this one is like most common and also mm -hmm. not the hardest hitting. Like, I think Enfeeble will screw over someone more than Frightened will. Yeah. Unless, you have to be creative with it. I just want to say this. You have to be creative with it. Like, yeah. frighten them off a cliff or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Possibly. Yeah, anyway. Uh, our advanced rune spell is called Delusional Pride. It's uh, focus four. Domain of confidence. Uh, see, two actions to cast. Somatic and verbal. Range of 30 feet. Targets one creature. Saving throw of will. And the duration varies. You make the target overconfident, leading to it to ascribe, uh, to ascribe failure to external factors. If the target fails at an attack roll or skill check, it takes a minus one status penalty to attack rolls and skill checks until the end of its turn, or the end of its next turn, if it's attempted the roll outside of its turn. If the creature fails a second time while taking this penalty, the penalty increases to minus two. The duration depends on the target's will save. After attempting a save, the creature becomes temporarily immune for 24 hours. Critical success, the target is unaffected. Success, the duration is one round. Failure, the duration is 10 rounds. And critical failure, the duration is 24 hours. So what I like about this, this is a really, really good uh, debuff. Mm -hmm. um, a critical failure, 24 hours of taking yeah. a minus one or a, a minus two if it fails a second time, uh, is a really good way to, I don't want to say shut off a boss fight entirely, because a lot of, a lot of um, elite characters have such high bonuses to hit that it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's insane. But, like, it's still a really good... Um, yeah, um, it's... Effect. It's one layer of that um, debuff cake that you're setting up. Because if you're debuffing, you're just setting up layers upon layers of debuffs. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, as long as the um, uh, the source of the buff or yeah. debuff isn't the same, then they can stack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because um, then it gets crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next one we have is Necromancy, which is the sin of gluttony. Uh, the Rune Lords of Necromancy tap into their constant hunger for more power and enhancing their longevity, potentially even into undeath. So the prohibited schools are abjuration and enchantment. <clears throat> Your initial rune spell is called Overstuffed, or Overstuffed from the Domain of Indulgence. Uh, it's a range of 30 feet, two actions cast, one living creature, save and throw, fortitude. Huge amounts of food and of food and drink fill the target. It receives a full meal's worth of nourishment, and must attempt a fortitude save. Critical success: the target's unaffected. Success: the target is sickened one. But if it spends an action to end the condition, it succeeds automatically. Failure: the target is sickened one. No chance of getting rid of it. Critical uh, failure: the target is sickened two. A target sickened by the spell takes a negative 10 status penalty to its speed until it's no longer sickened. So, uh, I, it's weird. Like, uh, so it's obviously just a sickened ability mm. spell, but there, there's no healing or nothing. It's just, yeah. I'm just going to, like, pop, and you're just going to mm. get, like, uh, very yeah, uncomfortable. I, I want to say this is basically um, that character from Monty Python, The History of the World. 
Yeah. Uh, the one who's like, um... Always eating? And he's like, would you like, a, would you like an after-dinner mint? Okay. And it explodes. Yeah. Uh, oh, God. It's, it's, there's a horror movie about this where, like, someone's just constantly, like... There's one where someone's constantly thinning away to, like, oh, they die of starvation. Dinner. It's a dinner. Steve, Stephen King... Based on a Stephen King novel, I believe. Yeah, and I want to say there's another one where it's basically that in like reverse and it's just it's not even about them being fat because that's that's not the point it's about them being filled with food magically like they're slowly mm -hmm. just like a balloon with air yeah. uh anyway take its course that's the next uh necromancy gluttonous uh spell power focus spell mm -hmm. again from the domain of indulgence two actions range touch one creature when someone has overindulged you can hasten them past the worst of their affliction or intensify their misery. This spell attempts to progress a disease affliction, a poison affliction, or a persistent poison damage affecting the target. If the target is affected by more than one of these, choose from one that you're aware of. Otherwise, GM chooses randomly. An unwilling target can attempt a will save to negate the take its course thing. The effect of the spell depends on whether you are attempting to end an affliction or persistent poison damage, <sighs> coffee burps, and whether you are attempting to help or hinder the target's recovery. So, affliction. The target immediately attempts the next saving throw against the affliction. You can grant the creature your choice of a plus two status bonus or a negative two status penalty to its save throw against the affliction. So if you want to use it to help your allies or hurt your enemies, you have that flexibility. Persistent poison. You can cause the target to take the persistent poison damage immediately when you cast the spell, in addition to taking it at the end of its turn normally. Whether or not you do so, the target attempts an additional flat check against the persistent poison damage. You can set the DC to flat check to 5 or 20 instead of the normal DC. Wow. So if someone has persistent poison damage, you can either attempt to help them get rid of it entirely, or you can uh, basically make it a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, oh, heightened level seven. You can attempt to pro to progress any number of the target's eligible afflictions. So when this thing is a seventh level spell, you're about level fourteen, level fifteen. You can do all of those things at once. You can let you go. I'm going to make your persistent poison damage worse. I'm going to make your disease factions worse. I'm just gonna make everything worse. Oh yeah. All right. Next up, we are at the last and final school. This is the school of transmutation and the sin of greed. All right. Rune Lords of transmutation not only transform objects to create value, but also transform and enhance their own power. Prohibited schools are enchantment and illusion. And the rune spells are, let's see, initial, appearance of wealth. Uh, let's see, focus one. Let's see, domain of wealth and two actions to cast, material and yeah, material and verbal, range of thirty feet and an area of a five foot burst, saving throw of will and a duration sustained up to a minute. You create a brief vision of immense wealth filling the spell's area. Each creature within twenty feet of the area that could be entranced by material wealth must attempt a will saving throw. A creature that enters the area automatically disbelieves the illusion and disbelieving the illusion ends only fascinated condition imposed by the spell. As long as you sustain the spell, other creatures react to the treasure like they would any other illusion, but they are not at the risk of becoming fascinated. Critical success. The creature disbelieves the illusion and is unaffected by it. Success. The target is fascinated by the wealth until it has completed its first action on its next turn. And failure. The creature is fascinated by the illusion. What I like about this and the charming touch and a bunch of other spells is that it allows things to continue making sense. Mm -hmm. How many times have we been playing a game where there's a spell that forces you mechanically to have this effect but at the cost of this narrative? And there's a lot of times where that doesn't add up. Like, for example, how many times we've been at the table with, like, you know, a gross player who's like, I'm going to flirt with, like, this bar person who does not like my assigned gender or my subscribed gender, whatever. Like, 
they're lesbian, I'm a dude, it's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. Ah, but I'm going to cast this spell and force them to like me. First of all, that's Creeps City. Gross. We all agree that person sucks and they should stop. Mm -hmm. But but still, mechanically, it doesn't make any sense that this would even be applicable, which is why I like the thing about Charming Touch is that if that person, as their own uh, uh, identity, would not like this person romantically, the spell doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Just like with the appearance of wealth. If wealth is one of their goals, this is going to have an effect. But if you have like someone who's uh, made an oath of poverty or someone who you know, tries to constantly give away their worldly possessions mm -hmm. or someone whose identity or goals are way more than material goods, then it would be really dumb if all of a sudden they really cared about gold, you know? Someone it's who's like, not roof up. <laughs> for, for lack of a better yeah. So, like, I can imagine Rufa going into the spell and it affecting them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make any sense to me if suddenly Woodward or Alona... Uh, because magic now cared about infinite wealth. Unless it's the infinite wealth of hooch. Well, I mean, or choco meat. I don't think she likes choco meat. I just think she likes the gains. But that's just, that's just, my, uh, that's just my thought. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I like about that is that the language that Pius was putting these abilities protects narratives that make mm -hmm. sense. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. All right. And now we're at the advanced rune spell, which is, which is called Precious Metals. Uh, focus four, domain of wealth, uh, one action to cast, uh, material, range of touch, targets one metal weapon, or up to ten pieces of metal or metal-tipped ammunition, one suit of metal armor, or up to one bulk of metal material, such as coins. It's a duration of one minute. Your deity blesses base metals to transform them into precious metals. The target item transforms from its normal metal to cold iron, copper, gold, iron, silver, or steel. Uh, let's see. An item transmuted in this way deals damage according to its new material. For example, a st steel sword transmuted to cold iron would deal additional damage to a creature with a weakness to cold iron. This change is clearly magical and temporary, so the item's monetary value doesn't change. You can't transmute copper coins to gold and use those coins to purchase something or as a cost for a spell. Let's see, heightened 8, you could add a, add a adamantite and mithril to this list of materials you could transform the item into. See, I like that because, like, adamantine is really good for, like, damage-resistant bypassing. Because you'll see this every now and then with, like, mm -hmm. constructs, like, DR, 5, 10, whatever, uh, adamantine. So, like, if you have adamantine, you can bypass that DR. Mm -hmm. uh, and mithril is good because I believe mithril makes a weapon, uh, an agile weapon or a finesse mm -hmm. weapon, something like that. Basically makes it lighter. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that is cool and needs to be remembered is that the Rune Lords are just as capable warriors and generals as they are mages. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, when you play this uh, archetype, you need to be really focusing in on both aspects. Yeah. Um, I also kind of want to say that this is super useful, especially if you have copper coins. One tactic you use is if you're fighting the Fae, copper coin, transmute it into uh, cold iron. Or you're mm -hmm. fighting uh, were creatures transmuted those copper coins into silver and basically use those as uh, sling weapons. Like, absolutely. PJ, would you, would you allow that? Absolutely. I mean, if you want to literally throw away your copper that way, yeah. Um, I think mm -hmm. you can also do that with uh, traditional ammunition as well. Yeah. Now, if you don't have ammunition, mm -hmm. uh, whether they be arrows or sling bullets, you can still get coins and just ping them at people. Yeah. Uh, and I at that point... Yeah. No, no, was, 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 I was going to say, um, I, I'm basically saying coins made for fact that says base metals... I don't think rocks would be considered a metal. So, yeah. Rocks, no, but they, uh, the bullets for slings also oh, yeah. come in, like, little lead pellets and True. stuff. True. It depends on what the, the, the understanding and lore you're using. I think yeah. rules as written, it still says ammunition. So, mm -hmm. have fun with it. Yeah. So, anyway, those have been the seven sins and the seven schools of the Rune Lords. And so, uh, yeah. PJ. Mm hmm. Uh,. Let, let, let's go back and forth. Uh, okay. Which school do you think I would be a part of? Well, 
just, just from what you've said on At the Table before and how you responded reading it, I'm going to have to go with, um, I, think, I think, either Enchantment or uh, Transmutation. I'm thinking the enchantment thing is I know you like I know you like playing like the characters who like the mind powers and the mind control stuff so I can see that working but also greed or uh, the transportation for greed because hey we live in a capitalist society everyone needs money mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but hey at least uh, I use my money for good I'm, I'm, I'm adding air quote but good. Well, okay, so I, one of the things that I've always had a problem with with the alignment system, right, mm-hmm. is who is defining the morality? Um, because oftentimes the world settings for, for TTRPGs, the alignment setting is kind of the neutral morality compass that we all kind of more or less agree upon. And then we start judging peoples and countries mm-hmm. and demons and angels by our base moral compass, which is always kind of weird because, like, what if by their moral standard, they are good? They are doing everything a good demon should be doing, mm-hmm. you know? And then it's like, is, is this good that I'm doing? Is this evil that I'm doing? Like, it's always weird. Yeah, like, like that, one, um, that one comedy sketch. Are, are, are we the baddies? A hundred percent. And that's the dumb thing. Like, mm-hmm. you go to Cheliax, and they're like, please. Don't hate the player, hate the game. We're right. And then you know, the rest of the yeah. world's like, but you're, you're openly working with devils. Why are you dumb? Yeah, like at Chinchiliacs, Benny Rage is, well, all the rage. Well, <laughs> if Benny's out in the world, he might not be as liked as much. But Chiliacs, everybody loves him. He's a great Chilaxian. But, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, um, PJ, okay, mm-hmm. for you, I using the same... Um, same qualifications and uh, what you said before on, at the table, mm-hmm. and uh, essentially knowing that you're, for the lack of better ter- better term, a beefy boy. <laughs> I lift and eat food. Mm-hmm. I want to say evocation, the sin of wrath. See, I think you're right. I definitely feel like I don't know if my personal sin is wrath, mm-hmm. but I do know that I would want to play this. Mm-hmm. Just because, A, evocation spells are the most fun spells, mm-hmm. so they're, they're the flashy ones that hurt the bad guys. And also, I, the, the domain of zeal was always, like, my favorite for doing damage. Mm-hmm. So, like, you've, you've just given me two amazing things that I love. Like, yeah. a fireball wizard and a zeal paladin, and I'm yeah. just going to want to smash the face. You know what, PJ? I'm just going to say this now, at the, on this at the table some point next year, if we do a uh, one-shot in the world of Galerion, we, should, mm-hmm. we need to do a one-shot where everybody at the table is a rune lord. Ooh, I, I kind of love that, especially if we um, stick to, like, a different school so we don't yeah. have, like, a lot... That'd be so dope. I mean, it would take forever, because we'd have to have at least five to six players, seven, if we want to have, like, all seven represented. Like, one I... round of combat would take an hour but it'd be fun i would say you know what with uh, our current lineup of uh, how many players we have on stream we could have the players as uh room lords versus the p- players who are no, versus the a baddie who's the room lord of the sin that's not been chosen could be interesting uh, yeah. absolutely or we could do is have uh all seven rune lords versus like I don't know, something purely antithetical to mm-hmm. the Rune Lord magic system and ancient uh, civilization. Mm-hmm. Whatever we'll, that may be. Yeah, we'll make up a... Hey, we could also make up a Rune Lord school of divination. <laughs> <laughs> Just the one school that no one saw coming. Oh, yeah. no, I made that joke. Yep. Uh, <laughs> really quick, jumping in chat. Uh, Eric Jackson posted, Every time I hear Rune Lords, I can't help but think of the RPG Rune Crest. Rune Crest, man. Uh-huh. That takes me back. Is that the one... That was like, oh god, back in like two thousand and one, two thousand three. Oh, even and you could like be a miner and raise cows and then even like kill people. Way back then, way, but way, way back. I want to say nineties, early internet days. I kind of want to say. Because I know there's one that was like EverQuest, and then mm-hmm. there was one that was. You know, I'm gonna Google this. This yeah. this random tangent brought to you by Eric Jackson's, mm-hmm. aka RuneQuest reminder. Uh, god bless you, Eric Jackson. Yes, seventies, oh, seventies. 70s, 1978 by mm-hmm. the Chaosium. Yeah. Uh, also jumping in the chat, uh, Weep Psyche posted, 
Alignment standards are not set by the gods because they're the only ones strong enough to influence public opinion and st so societal morality strongly enough. Yeah, alignment standards are set by the gods. I can definitely see that, um, narratively speaking, mm -hmm. of course. Like, oh, yes, we know that this is good because our god said this is good. I can see that. Yeah. Um, but I feel like there's, there's a bit too much of that human bleed when it comes to mm -hmm. alignment in TTRPG. It's like, yeah. well, your god says it's good, but my moral compass says this. Uh, and it does cause some um, conflict. Now, yeah. it's, it's still an interesting question. Like, what happens if your gods say this is evil or good or whatever? You know what? This will be a good conversation to have on our discord so oh yes how about let's um after the show let's uh, pose that question in our discord in the at the table uh channel and i'll hundred percent and i will put a link to that right now in chat and we'll and we'll tag bearded skull because i'm sure ian would love to continue yep. the uh philosophical question about the alignment uh speaking um, of which let's go into the rune lord dedication pj why don't you take yes. it away thank you thank you so now all those cool things we just told you about the fact that you're going to get three focus points for free, that you're going to be able to re refocus all of them for a 10-minute refocus thing for free, all this really cool crap that we just mentioned, that's just level one stuff yeah. that levels up with you. Those aren't feats. Now we're actually getting into the archetype. That's just cool mm -hmm. free stuff. The Rune Lord dedication that you get at level two. Uh, your rune magic increases, and you practice with your school's associated weapon. You gain an additional cantrip of your chosen arcane school, and each time you gain a level, including this level, you add an additional spell from your chosen arcane school to your spell book, with the same restrictions as the two spells you normally add. So you're probably going to get a lot more knowledge, but it's going to be hyper-focused knowledge, because mm. there's like two schools you're not allowed to touch. Mm -hmm. So like if you're going to evocation, have all the fireballs. Yeah. Uh, if you go into abjuration, or whoever doesn't who doesn't get uh, abjuration. Um, yeah, abjuration. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a, uh, abjuration, you're not gonna get. You're not allowed to get any evocation spells. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have to really focus. Yeah. Differently. Yeah. Let's see. Ah, water. Uh, and then, uh, so that's that. Why don't you get the embed Aeon Stone? All right. Uh, level two, you can also get. Uh, the embedded Aeon Stone. See, you have to have the prereq of Rune Lord dedication and trained in crafting. You discover the secrets of embedding Aeon Stones into your flesh. You spend one day attuning an Aeon Stone and physically embedding it into your skin. While the stone is embedded this way, you gain the benefits of Aeon Stone as if it were opening above your head, but it, but it protects the stone from being noticed or stolen as easily. Aeon stones in your flesh must be invested to function as usual. You can also use sensitivity to safely remove an embedded Aeon stone in one day. Someone without this feat can attempt to surgically remove it by, if safely, by safely spending one day and succeeding a DC 30 medicine check, or hastily by simply oof, ripping it from a corpse. So keep in mind, this is a level two feat. If there is someone at level two who's going to pop out a DC 30 medicine check, uh... Investigator, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, but this is this is awesome, because, like, uh, Aeon Stones are really, really cool, powerful items, and you just get to start stacking them into your body. Uh, and it looks like moving on down the line, just kind of cursory glancing, that's going to improve somehow. Mm -hmm. Um... This is the level, this is the third choice for a level two dedication, or level two feat after in, in that Aeon Stone. It's called Tattoo Artist, prereqs to be trained in crafting. This version of the Tattoo Artist feat is intended for use with an archetype and has a different level for access from the original feat. You can craft tattoos, including magical tattoos. When you select this feat, you gain the formulas for four common magical tattoos of second level or lower. You get a plus one circumstance bonus to crafting checks to craft a tattoo. If you're a master in crafting, this is now a plus two. So now you are casting badass spells, fighting with a badass polearm, and now you're putting tattoos into you and your friends that give them more mm -hmm. magical effects. Like, yeah. these, these guys are so cool. Yeah, it reminds me of that X-Men character. Um, well, the character that gave uh, another character, Ink, his powers, which was a tattoo artist who would basically draw, like, symbols and ink was able to activate the powers through those uh tattoos 
Yeah, um, there's a, oh god, there's a, uh, a DC villain that does that mm -hmm. too. I think his name is the Tattooed Man. Yeah, uh, Superman villain. A, yeah, he's a Superman villain, and for a, a short period in time, I think he was a Green Lantern villain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because Green Lantern's like, I make a construct. He's like, cool, my tattoo comes to life. All right. Let's see, um, PJ, why, oh, it's my turn, never mind. Aeon Resonance. Re Resonance. Resonance, Resonance, yeah. Aeon Resonance. Uh, let's see, prereq is embedded Aeon Stone. You gain the reticent, res, ah, I don't know why I can't say that today. You gain the power of one embedded Aeon Stone as if it was placed in a Wayfinder. While you can embed multiple Aeon Stones into your flesh, you gain the Resonance power from only one embedded stone at a time, selected each day when you make your daily preparations. Uh, special, at level 8, you can take this feat again, and if you do, you gain the power up to four invested Aeon Stones instead of only one. Oh, this so, is... yeah. Oh my, it's so good, because I don't know if you know, uh, chat, how great Aeon Stones are. They're, they're very subtle. You get a handful of low levels, you're like, okay, these are nice little perks here and there, but when you put them into a Wayfinder Compass, mm -hmm. they get a little more powerful. Now... You are the Wayfinder Compass, and you can have, at level 8, four of these things super, like, roided in your body. Like, again, these guys are so cool! I'm, I'm not gonna lie, but I've been looking up the Aeon Stones for a long, long time, and maybe something down the line for Rufa. Maybe, maybe. Or another character. Oh. But, yeah, um... Uh... I think uh, PJ, hopefully PJ's still there, or he froze, but um, next up is his turn, and he's going to talk about pole arm tricks. Let's see, really quick, uh, jumping in the chat, uh, hello Pangu-chan, hello, good morning, uh, Reef Psyche, this was super great in PF1. PJ, yep, are you I there? Think, I there? think we're back. Yep. Cool. You're back. Cool. cool, cool, cool. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the internet has been absolutely dreadful out here. It's mm. very unreliable. I think I'm connected to one that could work for a little... Um, can you see me and hear me? Yes, yes. Cool, cool, cool. Um, also, thank you, Chan. Before I go again from the internet, I really want to say thank you for coming in. Always great to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, so next one is called Polearm Tricks. This is your level six feet choice. Oh. Jinxed. <laughs> Hopefully he'll come back again soon, guys. Uh, but anyway, I'll jump in chat reading uh, what Reap Psyche just posted. This was super great in Pathfinder First Edition. Uh, I had like 10 grafted into my level 16 character for a game. Oh, you're back? Okay, you're back. Am I back? You're back. Oh, God in heaven, help me out. I, I, I just been vamping. I've been vamping and reading chat. <laughs> Good, good. Thank you so much. Are we still? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're still, we're still here. We're still here. Thank you so much, people. I don't know what mm -hmm. it is. Like I said, I, I got back to Santa Clarita, and no internet works out here right now. Do pull arm um, tricks before something happens. Yeah. So pull arm tricks gives you the critical specialization effect of pull arms. Um, what that does is, let me look at pull arms really fast for you guys. Here we go. Okay. The target is moved five feet in any direction of your choice. This is forced movement. Boom. There you go. Mm -hmm. It's actually really uh, quite useful, especially if you're on a ledge. Yeah, you could just hit them and knock them off the ledge. It's forced yeah. movement, so they have to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next. Oh, uh, by the way, that was a level six feet, I believe. Uh, yes, that was the level six feet. It's the only one at level six, mm -hmm. so might as well take it and get that critical specialization. Yep. All right. Now we're moving on to level eight feet, which is called Sin Reservoir. Uh, prereq for this is uh, Rune Lord Dedication, so yeah, pretty simple. During, during daily preparations, you can indulge in your associated sin. When you do, you gain one additional spell slot of any spell level up to two levels below the highest level wizard spell that you could cast. You can prepare only a spell of your specialized school in this slot. As with any act, indulging in your sin might change your alignment if your behavior harms someone else. Uh, yeah, this is a great way to add another spell. And also, yeah, you're gonna be indulging. You're pretty much gonna be indulging in your sin 
anyway to recharge your focus spells. So might as well also get another spell out of it. Yeah, getting additional spell slots today are always good. Um, and as wi as wizards, you already have like so many mm -hmm. more. Like if you're an evocation wizard, more fireballs. Yeah, why not? Uh, next up, it's a level ten, and the only level ten feat there is, which is fused polearm. Uh, your arcane bonded item is your polearm, and that's something I uh, I don't think we got to mention. Mm -hmm. But one of the cool things about rune lords is that their glaives can be not only their arcane bonded item, but you can also put a custom magical staff as the haft of your polearm. So not only are you carrying this magical weapon, but the haft of that magical weapon is also a magical staff for all the intents and purposes a magical staff provides a, a caster. Like, this is so amazing. Oh, yeah, just this custom kitted out thing. Yeah. So here's what f the fused polearm does. During your daily preparations, you can magically fuse your arcane bonded weapon and a magical staff together, like I mentioned, into one item, with the staff making up the haft of the weapon. You prepare the staff at the same time you do this, and you can only do this with the staff that you're able to prepare. The fusion lasts until the next time you make your daily preps. While the two are fused, the weapon's, the weapon's haft takes an aesthetic aspect of the staff. So you are further combining your powerful magic items, your powerful melee attacks. It, it, it's so good. It's yeah. so good. Or you could be like me and um, fuse a clown squeaky hammer on the tip of your uh, staff and call that your fuse pole arm. I mean, it rules is written, still works. Yeah, just like pound, squeak, 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 squeak. So it's so at level ten, you get this awesome ability to combine magical weapons and magical items. At level eight, you can either choose additional spell slots or four Aeon stones, you mm -hmm. know, roiding into the gills. Like these guys have so much yeah. cool power potential. All right, next we have a level twelve feat, which is called School Counterspell. Prereq for this is Counterspell and Rune Lord Dedication. Your intricate knowledge of your school lets you easily negate spells from that school, instead of being able to encounter a foe spell with Counterspell only if you have the same spell prepared. If the foe casts a spell from the school matching your specialization, you can Counterspell it by with any other spell of the same school. So this is dope, because I don't know if, uh, if some of you were there when we covered, I think it was the Sorcerer, mm -hmm. uh, but Wizards can only counterspell, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, they can only counterspell a spell if they, are, if they have that spell prepared. Yeah. So this means if someone casts um, Fireball, and you do not have Fireball prepared at all, you cannot counterspell it. And that's... I'm not going to lie, it's kind mm. of disappointing. Yeah. But this is good because if anyone casts any spell from any school that you are proficient in, mm -hmm. like in this case, uh, you are the sin of greed or gluttony, and it's necromancy. Anytime they cast a necromancy uh, spell, any necromancy spell at all, turn that crap right off. Yeah. Honestly, I wish school counter spell was available for all spell casters. That should, be, that should have been how the counter spell, the base counter spell should have been done, honestly. Yeah, I think they changed that in Pathfinder 2E because we've all seen it in the other edition, how mm -hmm. broken it gets to the point mm -hmm. where, I mean, I've, I've dealt with what I call a counterspell rally or counterspell mm -hmm. uh, uh, ping pong, where you're just sitting there just blowing counterspells left and right because since it's so nebulous and so easy to use, they get tossed around like candy and nothing gets done. The GM yeah. doesn't get a chance to play. The players are on full defensive support and they're not doing anything offensive and it just becomes this annoying game of well I counterspell your counterspell well I counterspell the counterspell of my counterspell and it's like this is y'all this is dumb yeah. and it, as much as it sucks or as much as it's disappointing in Pathfinder 2E it, it, <laughs> it doesn't make it overpowered to the point where it gridlocks everything alright um, PJ why don't you take the capstone uh, feat for the school all right, this is your level 18 feat, so it's going to be a while. It's called the School Spell Redirection. When you counterspell a spell with a school matching your specialization, if you critically succeed at your counteract check, or if you, or if you succeed while using a spell of a higher level than the spell you countered, 
you can redirect that spell that you countered. You choose the target, area, and other aspects of the spell and use your own spell DC, spell attack rule, or other statistics as appropriate to determine the effects. Ooh, Just I like, like a monk redirecting a missile, mm -hmm. you're literally grabbing that spell in midair and throwing it back at your enemy with your stats to it. I really like this. I really this is heck and I wish you could get this at a lower level, but I understand you the reason why you can't because this is heckin' powerful. So good. And and at level eighteen, the kind of spells that you and your enemies are gonna be throwing are gonna be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That's a level nine spell that you're now countering and throwing back at someone. Yeah. Yeah. That's and the fact that as a rune lord dedication, it's only the school instead of the specific spell, it could literally be anything in your wheelhouse. Imagine throwing back a level nine uh, necromancy spell. Those things get ridiculous to the point where you're killing just swaths of people. Yeah. And it's, oh, it's yeah, so especially good. if you're um, an enemy spellcaster, cast anime dead and bring brings up forth a legion of skeletal warriors, you could be like, all right, redirect those uh, skeletal warriors that you just summoned. They're, uh, they're working for me now. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not entirely broken because you're mm -hmm. still spending the spell slots. Yeah. You're still losing that spell slot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would love, and I'm sure there's some rule about the level one specializations, um, but I would love to combine a rune lord and a flexible caster. Mm. Sure, I get less spells a day, but if I'm going evocation, I'm basically a glorified like Magus Paladin <laughs> at this point. Then I'll just start, you know, oh, I'm gonna steal all your magic for you. I mean, throw that you go. back out there. You go. There you go. All right. Um, yeah. So yeah, that has been the rune lords. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was so excited because I I know about the rise of the rune lords lore and like new and old Thassalon and. Damn it, this did not disappoint. The fact mm -hmm. that you are an amazing, powerful caster, focused caster, too, with using that focus as you know, the, the best magic defense I've ever seen, incorporating magic abilities to make your weapons dope as hell, combining them with magical staffs so you don't lose a minute of both optimized DPS with melee, optimized magical power, and you're doing this to the wizard, which we haven't gone in deep dive, but everything yeah. I've read about the wizard online says the wizard's a little disappointing mm -hmm. not with this yeah not with this honestly wizard rune lord they're kind of essentially maguses magus it's it's a magus without the spell strike yeah and the spell yeah. strike is the crux but you don't need it when you're casting like yeah ze a mighty zeal yeah. all the time you're you're a spell caster magus or magus specializing in spell casting mm -hmm. yeah but anyway um PJ, should we jump into our next archetype? Yeah, this will be our next and last one for the day. Hopefully we can cram this out in the next 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. We will see. But welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the final archetype. We've talked about the magic of old lore. We've talked about a way to change how you cast literally anything in the game. Now, what if what if could control the Geomancer is the next one we're going to be covering. Uh, and why don't you start off with that that first little paragraph of the, the lore. All right, Geomancer. Uh, Secrets of Magic, page 212. You know how to draw power from the land around you, no matter the terrain, by attuning your magic to match its mystical properties. You might be a druid with an elemental focus, such as the flame, stone, or wave orders or a naturalist with a touch of magic at your disposal. You could concentrate on a single type of terrain to wring every last drop of power from it or choose to wander the land to experience every type of terrain possible. All right, I'm getting a, a, a big Planeteers vibe from this. <laughs> well, maybe. I think just judging from this awesome artwork in this book, mm -hmm. it's going to probably function more like Toph. Yeah. from uh, uh, Avatar, or mm -hmm. maybe like Final Fantasy Tactics. Mm -hmm. But the Geomancer dedication, taken at level 2, uh, the, you have to have the ability to cast from spell slots at least one spell with either air, cold, earth, fire, plant, or water trait, and you have to be trained in nature. So obviously the druid is the easiest way to do this, or potentially a cleric. Mm -hmm. uh, you feel a deep connection to the world no matter who you are a phenomenon known as terrain attunement. 
When you expend a spell slot to cast a spell with a trait that corresponds to the type of terrain that you are currently in, as listed below, you gain a terrain attunement effect to that type of terrain. The GM might determine an attunement applies as long as it's prevalent enough for you, uh, around you. For instance, you might be in aquatic terrain, or a riverbank, or on a boat. Similarly, uh, similarly, similarly, that's what it is, one place might count as multiple types of terrain, such as a mountain in the far north being both arctic and mountain, which makes sense. In this case, you can choose only one terrain attunement effect, even if the spell has traits that would apply to each terrain type. Certain terrain attunements affect your enemies instead of you. If they do, when you cast a spell, you apply the listed effect to all enemies, who are either adjacent to you or in the area of the spell, or targeted by the spell. These enemies receive the listed saving throw against your spell DC to attempt to avoid the effect. Aquatic. Water. You ride the currents of water. If you are in the water, you gain a swim speed equal to your land speed. If you're on a surface, temporary waves of water follow your movements, allowing you to use your swim speed, if you have one, as your land speed. So it's kind of a cool switcheroo there. Arctic. Uh, cold. Arctic rime covers your foe's bodies. Enemies must attempt a fortitude save. They take a negative 5 status penalty to speed for 2 rounds and minus 10 on a critical failure. Uh, desert. Fire. The scorching heat of the desert dehydrates your foes. Enemies must attempt a fort save. On a failure, they are fatigued until they drink water and another potable liquid. Or, or another potable liquid. Forest. Plant. Branches and vines reach out to get in your foe's ways. Enemies must attempt a reflex save on a failure. They become clumsy one for one round, two on a critical failure. Uh, you have mountain, which is earth. Uh, the rugged endurance of the mountain protects you from harm. You gain resistance to physical damage except adamantine, uh, equal to the spell level for one round. Three DR, always great. Um, Plains, also plant, but growing fields and pulsing vitality of the plants provide you vigor. You gain temp HP equal to the spell level for one round. Sky, air, you, a gust of wind carries you aloft. You can fly up to 10 feet. If you're in the air at the end of your turn and don't have a fly speed, you fall. Uh, swamp, also plant. Your magic draws in noxious swamp gas to fumigate your foes. Affected foes take persistent poison damage equal to half the spell's level, minimum one, with a basic fort save. So I think they have to save first before they take the damage. The endless darkness of the cavern depths of the underground, which is Earth, uh, opens up its secrets to your senses. For one round, you get dark vision, as well as imprecise tremor sense out to 15 feet. Uh, especially, you can't select another dedication feat until you've got two of these. So... At the first dedication feat, you're basically getting this thing that when you cast a spell in an area, there's kind of this bonus area of effect depending mm -hmm. on the area you are in. You're not so much controlling the earth around you. You're just getting a benefit for where you're casting the spell. Yeah. Um, this, honestly, it reminds me of the Geomancer class from uh, one of my favorite video games of all time, Final mm -hmm. Fantasy Tactics, but so much better. So much better. Um, Geomancer, Geomancer in Final Fantasy Tactics, real quick, takes a lot of planning and um, clever plays. But in this game, in uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you just cast a spell and um, depending on the terrain you're in, it gives you something, a little something extra. Yeah, and I like that. Because like, it's one thing if you're in Final Fantasy Tactics and the entire excitement of the game is kind of being smarter... Mm -hmm than the, the encounter you're in, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's a little more difficult in things like Pathfinder uh, or any TTRPG when, you know, you're doing theater of the mind or you're just trying to focus on what you have already than to figure out some tangential tactic. Mm -hmm. I like that this is just a free a free effect that happens yeah. because of where you're casting this. Yeah. All right. Um, let's jump into the other feats. Uh, level four, you get uh, a two-manship with which is a uh, free action. Frequency, once per 10 minutes, and the prereq is Geomancer Dedication. Requirements, your previous action was to cast a spell with the Air, Cold, Earth, Fire, Plant, or Water trait. The magic of your spell, uh, the magic of your spell floods into you. 
overriding your connection to the land around you. You alter your terrain attunement to a terrain that matches a trait of the spell you just cast. You thereby gain your terrain attunement benefit when you cast further spells with the same descriptor, instead of using the terrain you're actually in. For example, if you cast Tanglefoot, your terrain attunement switches to the choice of Farce or Swamp, and your terrain attunement applies when you cast another plant spell. Your terrain attunement reverts to that terrain you're in one minute after you use attunement shift. Interesting. So, like, if, if the benefit of the spell that you'd cast in that area isn't really one that's necessary, like, mm -hmm. you don't really like it, you have the chance of changing what that gives you to something a bit more beneficial depending yeah. on your spell. Yeah, like, uh, say, um... You don't need, say you're in the water, and uh, you don't really need that swim speed at the moment. But you might want, uh, you might want to tangle somebody up with your uh, plant spell. I would say as flavor, instead of, uh, you know, like vine stuff, seaweed. Seaweed would choke your opponents. Mm, yeah, and then you get the plant benefit instead mm -hmm. of the, the water benefit. Yeah, yeah, that's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. Um really comes down to players who know how to be crafty with these kind of traits. Uh, the next level of four uh, uh, feat here is called Shared Attunement. When you would gain a benefit from your terrain attunement, you can grant it to one ally within 30 feet instead of yourself. This has no effect if the terrain attunement affects your foes instead of granting you a benefit. So that fly speed, you can grant that to an ally and shoot them out of there. Um, but if it would be... I think of a good one that hurts people. Swamp. Yeah, you probably don't want to yeah. give your allies persistent poison damage. Yeah. They won't be your friends much longer. Uh. Well, unless you're there, you know, going up against you. Not say self-defense. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, technically they're no longer your allies at that yeah. point. True, true. All right. Um, next up is a level six feat called Rough Terrain Stance. It's one action, and prereq is. Geomancer Dedication, and also you have to be an expert in nature. The requirements are you gain a terrain attunement benefit this turn. You enter a stance that makes it difficult to move around you. Each square adjacent to you becomes difficult terrain that matches the terrain attunement you gain. Rhyme forms in an arctic terrain. Uh, momentary undergrowth shoots up from the far terrain, and so forth. You ignore this. Uh, you ignore this difficult terrain. The stance ends if you move into a different type of terrain. Interesting. I kind of like this. It's like a passive mm -hmm. ability because we've all seen it. There's like there's yeah. so many spells that create difficult terrain. This is just. I mean, it's not for free. It's one action, but yeah. you're not casting a spell to do so. Yeah, that's kind of useful. It's kind of like a nature version of attack of opportunity. So instead of you swiping them as they're moving into your square uh they're affected by your terrain um your difficult terrain yeah and, and just the uh idea of difficult terrain i think the guy kind of cuts their speed in half mm -hmm. uh it definitely makes being a druid and potentially being squishy a lot safer you're, you're running away from your enemy yeah you're preventing them from from closing the gap on you uh let's see what a tune stride is this is the level eight dedication feat and what I like about it is there's not a ton of options. It's just two, four, six, eight. Well, two for number four, but like two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. It's just mm -hmm. what it is. Uh, a tune stride. Expert in nature. Geomancer dedication, of course. You can move freely through terrain that you are tuned to. When a terrain attuned that you ignore difficult terrain in a corresponding type of terrain until the end of your next turn. Pretty self-explanatory. Oh, I'm in the water. I'm activating water stance or whatever. I'm just going to move through water. Super easy now. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next, at level 10, you gain an ability called Draw from the Land. It's one action. A prereq is Geomancer Dedication, and you have to be an expert in nature. At this point, you're probably going to be an expert in nature if you're a Geomancer. Especially uh, level 10, yeah. Yeah. Requirements. You gain a terrain attunement benefit this turn, and it matches the terrain you're in. You pull strength from the surrounding terrain. You gain temporary hit points equal to your level. They last for one round. If you previously gained the plains, uh, the plains 
terrain attunement effect this turn, combine the temporary hit points together. So basically you get a you get a bit of a HP buffer. Yeah. It's it's not bad. Uh I mean mm -hmm. it's always good, especially if, if you you know, try not to die mm -hmm. and you're you were yeah. a little squish. Um and it's one action, so you in theory can activate uh, a terrain benefit from a spell, free action to, to, I guess, make the difficult terrain, and then with the last action, draw temp HP. So there's a tactic here that allows you to mm -hmm. strike and keep yourself... Um, yeah, go full defense. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, next up, level 12, read the land. You master in nature. You've learned how to commune with the land to learn information. You learn the Commune with Nature ritual if you didn't already know it. You can perform this ritual with a casting time of one hour instead of one day uh, without a secondary caster. And the Commune with Nature ritual, which is a level six ritual, so it's, it's a hefty one. Um, it is a primary check of nature to roll. Uh, duration up to ten minutes is how long it will last. Uh, same as Commune, except you can contact the Primal Spirits of Nature which know about animal, beasts, fey, plants, topography, and natural resources within a three-mile radius. And commune, um, let's see here. You call upon an unknown, a unknown planar entity. Basically, you get to ask seven questions that are yes and no. Um, and you have to make a roll against mm -hmm. some of it. Uh, you, but that's, that's mm -hmm. not the point. Th this, honestly, this is really really good when you need to scout out uh your immediate area mm -hmm. uh so i think the next one is yours yep it's uh level 14 it's called shifting terrain one action prereq is rough terrain stance and you have to be a master in nature requirements your terrain attunement matches the terrain you're in and you're in rough terrain stance you slam your fist into the ground, or twirl your arms about to create the terrain around you to shift and ripple, potentially throwing others off balance. Each creature within your area of uh, difficult terrain from rough terrain stance must attempt a reflex saving throw against your spell DC with the following effects. After you use the action, you can't use it again for 1d4 rounds. Critical success, the target is unaffected. Success, the target is clumsy 1 for 1 round. Failure. The creature is clumsy two for one round. Critical failure. The creature is clumsy two for one round and falls prone. So essentially, you become a Pokemon that uh, uses their earthquake ability. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and clumsy's not bad. You yeah. know, it, it does give them, I think, penalties to uh, hit and I think some movement penalties mm -hmm. as well. So it's a really good crowd control effect for like either one really powerful boss or mm -hmm. when you're getting swamped by, by minions. As mm -hmm. always is the way. Ain't me, itchy face. Mm. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Now, so shifting terrain's nice, but here's the other level 14 feet. Uh, and I was wrong. I thought I was just beep that boop boop. But terrain mm -hmm. shield looks like it's the other choice. Yeah. Uh, it says here you gain a terrain attunement. This is the, the requirements. Uh, you have to have a master of nature, and you gain a terrain attunement benefit since the start of your most recent turn, and that attunement matches the terrain you're in, and the trigger for this, uh, which can only be done once per 10 minutes, is a strike would damage you. You're so attuned to the land that it rises up to protect you from a potentially fatal blow in, in a seeming coincidence. For instance, a branch suddenly falls from a nearby tree to take the brunt of a sword swing, or a surprising charge of current disrupts your enemy's attacks. You gain resistance to the physical damage equal to double your level against a triggering strike. That, that means th at, at level you get the spell, you are getting a resistance of 28 to whatever damage you're about to take. That's, that's, that's really nice. good. That's nice. Yeah, that is... Really good. It is once per 10 minutes, so once per combat, but still... It's one of those clutch moments. And I just like the visual of a tree branch just, like, bonking on someone's head. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun. It, it, the the flavor is kind of silly. I think it's because I didn't want to go full on... Um, Avalanche from, from X-Men? Sure, but I was thinking more like, like an Earthbender. Oh. Remember in that awful movie that doesn't exist oh. 
there's a scene where a firebender and earthbender are fighting and the earthbender kind of like raises the wall up and the fire hits yeah. the wall. Yeah. Like in my brain, that would be the go-to narrative mm -hmm. that the, that you're actually making it move, but they seem to want to make it more like, oops, you missed. Uh, or oops, you didn't hit me as hard. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but hey, I'm here for but it. You know, but you know what? This is, this is Pathfinder, this is TTRPG. If you want flavor-wise, it's whatever you want to make of it that your GM is cool with. Absolutely. Hey, I don't care what anyone says. As long as it doesn't break the fun of anyone else, rule of cool is always the best rule. But not going to lie, a tree just bonking someone on the head or their hand is kind of hilarious. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, now we are at the capstone of the Geomancer uh, archetype. At level 16, you get access to Quickened Attunement. Free action, and it's a once per day prereq of Geomancer dedication, and you have to be le you have to be legendary, legendary. Mm -hmm. In uh, you wear that shirt just for today. No, no, but it's a happy coincidence. Wait, wait, no. I will say yes because it makes me sound smart. I mean, I like, I like the, the coincidence. That's an awesome coincidence. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But anyway, legendary in nature. Uh, the requirements is your previous action was attunement shift. If your next action is to cast a spell that would grant your terrain attunement bonus, reduce the number of actions to cast it by one to a minimum of one action. You can't use Quicken Attunement and Quicken Casting in the same round. That would make sense, because that that's too many um, metamagic feats, I don't think. Mm -hmm. See, your next action is cast a spell that would grant your terrain attunement bonus. Reduce. Okay, cool. So, like, basically this is, like, a lot of those really powerful attunement spells would be uh, two action spells. And again, as attunements, mm -hmm. they're just any spell that has one of those elemental types. Air, water, plants, whatever. So, like, if you're casting... I can't think of a really powerful air spell. Oh, what the hell, fireball, sure. It's, it's the easiest to go to. Let's say you're casting a nine-fold fireball, because why not? Then, instead of being a two-action cost, you can use this free action meta magic spell to make fireball cast one action, and then one action to attune, and then, heck, if you want to, last action to draw from the land. So you yeah. have temp HP. A lot or, of actions. Yeah. Or that uh, last action would be uh, GTFO! <laughs> Yeah, if you need to GT the FO, that's the way to go. Yeah. And, and this is why this is actually kind of a very good capstone feat. It, it's, it's tricky when you think about it, but since you're going to be a dedicated caster and magic's going to be mm -hmm. probably everything you're doing, and geomancy just gives you um, a fun side effect to casting magic mm -hmm. in different locations, this is kind of necessary to fully engage in all of this and yeah. give you enough economy of actions mm -hmm. to have more yeah. room for strategy. It's one of the it's one of those manipulation of your three action economy uh, feats. Absolutely. So it really does make sense this is a 16th level feat. Mm -hmm. uh, so Michael Powell, what do you think about the Geomancer? Honestly, I love this. I actually right now I'm in my brain, I'm thinking of a uh, a druid geomancer character to play in uh, possibly a upcoming one shot or something. It's really interesting, and I like the fact, especially, oh, actually, it's super useful in long campaign, especially because, especially if, you go, if you're going from um, exploring the world, and you're going to be in a different terrain every few games. Yeah, I think you hit on a very good point there. Um, Long-term campaigns really get more, you know, kind of punch out mm -hmm. of Geomancer, because what makes it fascinating is the, the, um, the versatility of the environment. Yeah. If you're and, in the same environment for like a one shot, it's like, okay, well, I know everything I'm going to do is only going to give me this one benefit. Yeah. But I also want to say in those long campaigns, I would say even uh, the GM would definitely also appreciate it because that gives them something else to play around with. True, true. Uh, and that's what I say. Like, I think it's, it's also kind of difficult if you think about it. Like, how do you make a Geomancer concept interesting? Like, do we just go, oh, okay, I can do Earthquake, and I can do, like, I can throw stones. Like, eventually, okay, why don't I just be an Evocation Wizard and flavor everything like that? I really love they've made it still a Geomancer in some way, mm -hmm. but they've done it with an additive system that 
it kind of creates more flexibility and fun as opposed mm -hmm. to just kind of limiting you to just like earthquake spells all the time. Yeah, I kind of want to say, um, what is it? Uh, if you want to kind of, I guess you could say, uh, Asian code this, Asian code this, especially, you know, right now, Shang-Chi, oh, so good, so good. Uh, I saw it. No, no, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm hearing so good, so good. Damn. Yeah, but um, if you want to Asian cope this uh, archetype, Geomancer, Feng Shui, a Feng Shui master. Ooh. Oh, dude, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, especially, that's so cool. Especially with, you have, since you have the directional directions, like we, uh, like in that episode we talked with um, Eunice mm -hmm. about, uh, like, you know, the, let's see, it was, I believe it's uh, the Black Tortoise is north, then you have the east is the dragon, West is West is I want to say the tiger or something, and then south is something. I'm blanking. Let me, let me look this up because I think I want to say again. This is just me being a weeb. This is not me being smart. Phoenix, but, Phoenix, something, something's Phoenix. Yeah, I, I think the the fire bird is the north. I want to say uh, the turtle is the east. The south is the white tiger, and the west is the blue dragon. See. Someone get the comments and correct yeah. us. Uh, I always look forward to your yeah. correction. I am looking at this right now. Uh, see, according to... Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, the east is the azure dragon. Mm -hmm. the, south, the south is the vermilion bird. You are right. The north mm -hmm. is the black tortoise, and the west is the white tiger. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah, I would definitely want to code this into a geomancer, into a feng shui... Um, Practitioner. I absolutely adore that flavor because mm -hmm. that is something that uh, can carry the spirit and cultural culture of something and still just as base mathematics as just simple game algebra still still work. You don't have to like uh -huh. play with anything too much. And also if you want to not use uh, culture as a coding for it, you could play a contra uh, was it what do you call it? Controvert contra something? Basically, somebody, uh, a person who is co controverting the land or something. I'm, I'm, I'm mispronouncing it. I know I'm mispronouncing oh, it. Oh, uh, 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 a conservation or conservation. Exactly, one? exactly. Yeah. A fantasy version of that, or a part. Honestly, fantasy park ranger. I mean, yeah, I'm here for that. Speaking yeah. of, be, oh, of... dude, dude, real quick. Yeah. Be a be a beastkin bear mm -hmm. as a geomancer. Ooh, I love that. Speaking, speaking of, of feng shui and uh, kind of chi Chinese Asian coast and coding something, I saw something in this beautiful, gorgeous book. Please pick it up. It just came out in the hard, hard mm -hmm. um, instead of just PDFs. Uh, something I think you'd like after we discussed mm -hmm. some awesome Chinese monsters, Chinese uh, creatures with Eunice. You know how you have talismans and things that you can affix and use really quickly? Mm -hmm. They've added fulus. Yep. As talismans that you I can wear. That. Oh, it's and the dope thing is, is that they're not just buffs that you can put on yourself. They're also with like a thievery check. You can place them on people and mm -hmm. debuff them with a fulo. Actually, that that's let's just say that's something I want to talk to you about um, probably after this episode. Heck yeah, dude! I'm um, down. That sounds exciting. But anyway, uh, really quick. Uh, so PJ, of mm -hmm. the three new archetype, the spellcaster archetype that we talked about. What's your list? This is this is tough because man, Pies are really putting the good work on this. I'm gonna say number one is is Rune Lord. A lore wise, so cool. Two, it really helps the all the problems people have been having with the wizard. And three, there's just so much potential to have a really cool customized character. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, flexible casting. Oh my god, it it is it is so good, especially when you do not want to deal with the headache of preparing spells and having all that stuff. For a war priest, it is it's so necessary. Yeah. Uh, and that does not mean Geomancer being the third is the lesser of the three. It's just a very different thing that I think gives druids and certain clerics such an awesome uh, uh, mechanic to engage with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, I want to say uh, definitely number one would have been, uh, let's see, Rune Lord because... Honestly, that's just that's just awesome. That's just badass. I'm not as familiar with uh, Pat, Pat, Pathfinder First Edition as you are, PJ, 
but from what I we've read here, uh, it honestly makes us it makes a spellcaster less squishy and viable in a small party. You don't always have to worry about your spellcaster if your spellcaster is a rune lord. 100%. Yeah, it's not going to be affecting your HP at all, but the one thing it gives is like, so the, especially with wizards specifically, mm -hmm. like, you, you know how like how video games have like those charts, those like, yeah. those like bar charts? So like, you know, with a wizard, it's like, uh, damage, me, HP, me, magical potential, and everything else is kind mm -hmm. of low. Having a rune lord finally pulls some of those bars up, so now your magical potential is still dummy thick, mm -hmm. but your, your melee output, your social output, all mm -hmm. of it's rising up and you're gonna have such a fun kit going. Yeah. I have this like plus three major striking ruined forpal bladed badass glaive. Mm -hmm. And here's my like level 20 crazy staff. <laughs> now I have this yep. sick looking weapon that's just two level 20 magical items put together. Mm -hmm. um, correct like, me if yeah. I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, L well, like I said, uh, was it a uh, rune lord reminds, basically if you wanna go with the other system, it's basically a warlock who concentrates on their spellcasting. Uh, Warlock, uh, Pact of the Tome, I believe. Uh, sort of, kind of. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can definitely see some, some carry over there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, definitely, it definitely enhances... Because uh, like, the wizard already has school magic. Mm -hmm. This goes, okay, we're going to keep your school magic, and we're just going to make it better. And it's like, yeah. that's, that's definitely something yeah. that is needed. Well, in Pathfinder, it's, they're based, I, I'm still going to say it. I'm, it's... Uh, it's a magus that uh, concentrates on their spell casting. Yeah, exactly. It's mm -hmm. definitely that. It's, it's a it's a magus or magus that uh, cannot spell strike. Mm -hmm. And we will go more into detail on that when we cover mm -hmm. the uh, magus. But anyway, I believe we are at that time, PJ. We are absolutely at that time. It is time to say goodbye. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. This beautiful book mm -hmm. just came out. It is it is strong. So much more content. We're gonna to get to it later, um, uh, and I hope you like this. We're gonna definitely dive deep into this more. Uh, Mr. Michael Powell, why don't you tell them who you are and where they can find you on that sweet, sweet internet? Well, as always, I am the dash, da dastardly dashing Michael Powell, and uh, you can find me all over the internet on my social medias, which is at Mr. Kapow. That's M R K A P A O, or my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Michael Powell does stuff because I do a lot of stuff like my YouTube channel called Fantastic Tales of Adventure. And also on Thursdays, I believe uh, Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'm on a little show called uh, Toyzilla Live on the Toyzilla Network channel here on Twitch where we talk about toy news and uh have some fun with uh, some nostalgia stuff, so hope to see you there. And how about you, PJ? My name is PJ McGaw. You can find me all over the internet at pj.mcgaw. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Come find me. Come friend me. Let's have fun. And when I'm out here Tuesdays with Mr. Michael Powell, you can find all of us here Wednesdays. And for the month of September, we're going to be taking a brief break from Edge of Legend to support the St. Jude Ch uh, Cancer Charity. Uh, for the month of September, from this week to the 29th of September, um, we're going to be doing the Fire Brand Pirates, the Fire of Life. If you like Indiana Jones, Pirates, and a good old-fashioned Ocean's Love and Heist, come in, tune in, support, and donate. Uh, we'll have, hopefully, some links and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. and hopefully, we'll be embedded with the uh, Cosplay IRL charity so we can help raise uh, resources, financial resources, for children's cancer, uh, uh, for St. Jude's. So come and tune in for that. It's still 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 11 of the next weeks. And then after that, in October, we're going back to Halloween with three very, very scary episodes and then one episode of What We Do in the Shadows, Adolf on Prime Edition. What other crazy stuff is happening? Well, I'm so glad you asked. This Saturday, September 11th, I will be part of a D&D &D Muppets uh, charity game where we are raising money for a charity to help give uh, underprivileged and inner city children uh, free lunches. So they don't have to unfortunately starve when they go to school. I will be playing Kermit the Cleric. Um, and so that'll be fun to play Kermit the Frog as a cleric of life. Uh, so tune in this Saturday, 
12 noon Pacific Standard Time, uh, I believe, at twitch.tv back, backslash Blackness and Dragons. Uh, I will put stuff out on social media and hopefully do a better job of giving you a title on Wednesday. And last but not least, on Mondays, for a short duration, I'll be playing Strength of Thousands with our friends at Tabletop Rolls. I'll be playing Benji, the Basenji African dog who likes to do stage magic. So I think that's it. Oh, yeah, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, that's it. Y'all, I've been losing my mind. I've been busy like a mother trucker. But <laughs> until we see you tomorrow night and next week, we'll see you here, same nat time, same nat channel, at the table. Bye. Safe, everyone. Bye. Bye.